Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Billy O'Mahony. I'm a network software engineer with Intel. Uh, I've worked uh, integrating um, OVS DBDK with uh, OPNFE oh. um, for a while. And more recently, I've worked on um, Open vSwitch DBDK itself. Yes, good morning. My name is Jan Scheurich. I'm uh, with Ericsson. I'm working in the cloud SNT, uh, where I'm responsible for data plane performance. And as part of that work, I'm also leading our Ericsson effort in upstreaming contributions to Open vSwitch together with partners like Intel and Red Hat. So let's get started. This talk is about ingress scheduling. Before we go into the details of how we suggest to do ingress scheduling in, in OVS, and when I say OVS, I mean explicitly OVS DPDK here, let me briefly introduce the use cases for that. Why is this crucial and important? Uh, I will also have a look at the current status quo in OVS DPDK and why it is not sufficient. And then I'll hand over to Billy to talk about his RFC work to address uh, the concerns and to, to provide some implementations that we can play around with and test in order to address these needs. So let's get started. Um, network function virtualization has been mentioned many times. Um, in our particular case, we are looking at deploying um, Open vSwitch as part of an SDN solution in a converged data center. Uh, a converged data center typically means that we don't have many physical networks to carry control plane traffic out of band. Uh, there is typically one big network fabric, and we want to carry tenant data, storage traffic, um, infrastructure control plane all over the same physical network. But that means we really need to have uh, proper quality of service and protection in order to uh, secure that our crucial, critical control plane traffic is not disturbed by overload created by tenants. Um, I have three particular use cases I want to mention here. Uh, we'll start with the most obvious one, um, critical one also. It's the in-band OVS control plane. Um, we have two examples here. Uh, link aggregation. We use uh, bonding on the physical network, so there is typically uh, a protocol called LACP run between OVS and the TOR switches to supervise uh, the state of the links. And that, by nature, is in-band with the tenant data. And we have to make sure that even if the links and the PMDs are overloaded, this gets through. Similar situation for uh, a protocol called bidirectional forwarding detection, BFD which uh, the SDN solution uses to monitor the connectivity uh, between the different compute nodes in the data center. Um, this is a protocol run between the OVS instances, and it's carried through the overlay tunnels, typically VXLAN or Geneve. Um, the second use case is a bit higher level. It's the, the actual VIM control plane. When I say VIM, it is uh, typically open stack. So we have... Uh, Rabbit MQ message bus, we have REST API calls over HTTP going between the different components of OpenStack on different compute servers. And since they share the same physical network, um, it needs to be protected. Um, this control plane typically uses the host networking stack on the compute nodes, uh, which interfaces the uh, provider bridge in OVS uh, through a dedicated control bridge, which is usually a tagged connected through a tag patch port. So this traffic is VLAN tag on the, on the uh, physical infrastructure. Um, how do I go back with this? OK. Yeah, a particular example of that VIM control plane I want to highlight here is OVS control plane itself. So the open flow and OVSDB control channels between an SDN controller centrally located somewhere and the OVS instance on all the computes has the same problem here. It needs to be protected. So <clears throat> status quo in OVS DPDK. Um, you are all probably familiar with that. We have uh, the traffic from the physical NICs and from the 10 and vhost user ports being pulled by uh, a couple of PMD threads. Um, we have the physical NIC distributing the ingress traffic through some hashing RSS mechanism into a couple of ingress queues, RX queues that are pulled by the PMDs each. And uh, the PMDs are processing the packets end to end and sending them to their final destination. It could be a tenant VM TX queue. It could be um, the, a host interface like the BRCTL local port 
or they could be injected into the internal state machines for the control protocols, BFD and LACP. Um, then we have the OVS vSwitch daemon thread, which is actually polling all the non-DPD ports, like the bridge control port, and it's forwarding packets into transmit queues. And it's important to note here that we have an asymmetric situation. Um, in the ingress direction from the physical network, um, we have queues where the control plane traffic, the orange traffic here, is intermingled with the uh, data plane traffic, the tenant data traffic. Whereas in the egress direction, each PMD, which handles tenant data, has its own transmit queue, and the vSwitch daemon, which handles the control plane, has its private transmit queue. And that makes a significant difference, as we will see. So now let's look at the overload scenarios. Um, the, the most critical one, as you will see, is the PMD overload, which can easily happen if at either a tenant VM or on the physical network we receive a, lo a large amount of small packets. Uh, in this case, the PMDs don't keep up, and uh, the ingress queues that are pulled by the PMDs run full, which means they start shedding packets. On the physical NIC, for example, packets will be dropped, and since we have a mixture of control plane and, and data plane, uh, both control plane and data plane will be affected e equally. Um, the egress direction is not affected because the egress control plane is handled by the research demon thread, which is not overloaded. Um, if we look at the link overload scenario, um, this is the case when there is a lot of large packets being sent, for example, by a tenant VM. Um, the situation looks differently because, again, queues run full. In this case, it's the transmit queues of the PMDs handling the, the data traffic. But since the vSwitch daemon thread has its own private transmit queue, that is not affected immediately. And if the NIC has a fair scheduling mechanism between its transmit queues, we will see that uh, the control plane traffic, even in that case, will get its fair amount of traffic and only tenant data traffic is being dropped. So in order to quantify these theoretical effects, we actually have done measurements on our NFEI setup. And uh, I don't want to go into all the details here, but uh, this measurement here, you can have a look at it later, is about PMD overload created by small packets on the physical ports. And uh, you can see that when you go when you actually create overload and uh, we start dropping packets on the physical ports, um, parallel control plane traffic gets affected. We simulated that with ping minus F running um, to the bridge port, and you can see the latency jumps up, and the packet drop is basically the same amount of packet drop as we have for the overall traffic. And uh, not surprisingly, this leads to BFD flapping. Uh, even with moderate overload, and if we increase the overload even higher, we see that the control plane, open flow control channel breaks because of echo replies missing and so on. So this is really serious service interruption, and it can very easily be provoked by any tenant running a traffic generator, DPD traffic generator in a VM and so on. Uh, contrast egress link overload, um, everything is hunky-dory because of this um, dedicated transmit queue. So this is not a critical scenario. Um, the next use case, and that is music for the future, is quality of service for tenant data. Because so far we have assumed we need to protect infrastructure control plane and the tenant data is all equal. But of course that's a myth. Uh, some packets are more equal than others. And also virtual network functions need protection for their critical control plane traffic. So this really requires a, an end-to-end -end solution for a tenant, control, tenant uh, um, quality of service. And very much of that is not in place today. But it will need to be solved in order to really support um, complex network functions that are clustered and need cluster membership protocols, very reliable, and so on. Um, so we'll not go into the details of that here, but I just want to highlight out this is, one of the, this is the next important use case that we need to uh, address. So I would... <clears throat> I would like to conclude here um, by summarizing basically what in our situation, with our setup, we have identified as the necessary priority scheme that we would have to apply on the physical ports in an NFI infrastructure. Priority one packets would be the in-band control plane packets. We have untagged LACP packets, uh, but we also have BFD packets that are typically, as you've seen, carried inside um, overlay tunnels. So a classification would really have, cannot really detect the BFD packet itself, but we would probably have to rely on uh, some IP DSCP of the outer IP header, which is 
inherited when the, the BFD packet is in, inserted into the tunnel. Second priority would be the VIM control plane um, protocols that I mentioned, and they can easily be detected by prioritizing certain VLAN tags. Then the rest is tenant data, and uh, as I said, we will probably need to prioritize certain parts of tenant data, and th that could in the future also be based on IPDSCP settings of the outer IP uh, headers that are derived either from tenant classification or from assigning priority to ports, for example, in Neutron. And then the base priority is all the bulk traffic, which we would like to, as in the, in the, in the past, spread across any number of PMDs um, in, in order to scale. OK, um, that's it from my side. And uh, I hand over now to Billy. Thank you, Jan. OK, I um, hope everyone agrees that, as Jan has outlined, um, yeah, traffic prioritization is a, a compelling feature for some important OVS use cases. So uh, when we started looking at this, um, originally it was actually in terms of um, uh, latency um, as opposed to traffic protection. Um, so what we wanted to do was uh, certain uh, prioritized packets here, the orange guys. Um, we wanted to uh, give those a, a better latency profile. And uh, we looked at having some kind of an early stage um, prioritize our uh, classification uh, system uh, at, at an early stage in the uh, PMD user space data path. Uh, but there's two problems with that. Number one, um, it's going to spend a lot of cycles um, to classify the packet. And uh, number two, uh, what do you do with the lower priority packets while you're uh, dealing with the higher priority packets? They have to go somewhere. And that would break uh, DPTK's run to completion uh, model, so that wouldn't be very efficient. So what we looked at next was um, introducing an additional um, uh, priority queue. So we would use uh, the DPTK RT flow API to offload that high low priority classification down to the NIC and then introducing um, an extra priority queue, put the priorities packets specifically onto that queue and then read preferentially from that queue. OK, so that preferential uh, read mechanism um, is like, super simple. Uh, if the queue is a priority queue, uh, the PMD will just keep reading from that queue until it is empty and only then proceed on to the other queues. Um, so OK, so as I said, okay, we, we looked at this originally in terms of latency. So how do we get on with that? Um, so, so it's very briefly, you can see here that uh, the, with this preferential reading mechanism and the priority queue, that packet latencies have dropped here. These are all different um, latency uh, buckets along the x-axis that they dropped. But what we didn't see was we didn't see a reduction in the worst case latency, which is really what we'd, what we'd hope to see. Um, but at the same time, we also kind of uh, uh, theorized that um, this mechanism uh, would, would offer overload protection um, for the prioritized traffic. So because the um, prioritized packets are going onto their own RxQ, there'll be more RxQ descriptors available for them. So as the PMD became overloaded, it would be the low priority packets that would be um, kind of shedded naturally off the end of the, the lower priority queue. And there wouldn't be any need for any uh, PMD cycles to be spent for, to implement that shedding. Um, so that was the theory. Um, so what, uh, what would happen in practice? So uh, Jan uh, carried out some experiments uh, in this regard, and I'll bring you to the results of that now. So um, if you look at the system under test, uh, the blue box on the far right-hand side, um, you can see there that you have a V-switch with uh, one PMD and two receive queues. And it's accepting uh, two types of uh, traffic. So on the green line, you have um, a base load uh, traffic that's to simulate um, lower priority tenant data. And then on the other queue, um, you have um, iperf traffic, and that's uh, there to simulate the higher priority control chain uh, traffic. So if you're very observant here, you'll notice that this is slightly different to the theory of the previous slide. Um, rather than having one NIC with two queues, we have two NICs with one queue each. Um, but it doesn't make any difference to the PMD. Um, it just deals in terms of receive queues. Um, this is just a, a simpler way uh, to um, 
to classify the, 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 the packets um, without having to go through the offloading classification. So what we're really testing here is this prioritized reading mechanism. Um, so uh, so the, when the experiment is run, uh, what happens is that with the green um, lower priority traffic is used to load up the PMD to uh, onto the reports that 100% of the cycles are being used for processing packets. And then at that point, the uh, iPerf uh, traffic is turned on and measure the loss of the iPerf traffic because that's simulating the important control pane traffic. So we run that um, experiment in two conditions. So the first condition is just as normal, no prioritization. So when we run it like that, um, the iPerf 3 uh, reports about 25, 28% packet loss. Um, which is as expected, that's kind of what the um, base load traffic also suffers at that stage. Uh, in the second condition, uh, we turn on the prioritized reading mechanism and all that packet loss disappears, um, which is good because iPerf is actually pumping out traffic as fast as it can, uh, about one gigabit per second. Okay, so I'm gonna move quickly through some of the remaining slides. Um, this is just to give you an idea of the current configuration uh, mechanism in the RC patch. Um, so this is just how you would kind of prioritize um, a particular ether type of traffic. And so this is a really simple configuration. And um, it's the only one we just kind of support in the RC patch at the moment. I'd main thing to notice here is that we're just using the OVS fields uh, syntax that's familiar to everyone from OF Kettle. Um, Obviously then we can um, and various fields together, um, as you would expect, um, or various um, uh, matches together. Uh, this one is a little bit more uh, in the future, uh, maybe to support you know, more than just high and low um, priorities, also maybe to add a, a medium uh, prioritization into it as well. Um, so we would also propose um, that maybe some applications would find it very useful to apply the filters in specific order. Uh, so uh, we would propose that the um, filters are uh, applied in the order which should find on the command line. So this is something that is supported by the RTE Flow API. Um, now with a specific driver and with a specific NIC, your mileage may vary. So it's probably a good time to mention error reporting. Um, so we'd propose that the error reporting um, would be done as a human readable string uh, into uh, OVSDB, into a column on the interface table, um, which is, I think, is a similar mechanism to what uh, some other error reporting uh, is currently done. Um, as um, we'd also propose that you know, any uh, additional queues that are introduced for prioritization, Q or queues, um, would be in addition to the queues, number of queues specified for the interface. So the normal traffic is RSS over the, the, the regular uh, RX queues there, and the priority queues would be uh, in addition to that. Oh, sorry, that's, um, okay. Um, okay, so some other uh, next steps we know we have to do that um, Kevin Trainer has done some uh, great work recently in. Um, rebalancing PMD to uh, RxQ or RxQ to PMD assignments um, so that over time OVS doesn't end up with some PMDs heavily loaded while at the same time other PMDs are not loaded at all. So we know that fans, uh, yeah, we know that's uh, some work that we're going to have to build on as well to uh, avoid kind of a similar situation with, um, with priority queues. Okay, so. Um, uh, next steps, um, I think we mentioned some of them there already. Um, I think I suppose one of the main ones is that we know that uh, there is a, a reasonable amount of uh, other features um, using RTE Flow API at the moment, and we know that uh, particular is a, a flow uh, classification offload um, RFC at the moment, so we know we're going to have to work uh, with those guys to make sure that all these features can be used uh, simultaneously. Uh, also, as I think Jan mentioned before, prioritization right up to the guest. Um, that's slightly further in the future again. Okay, so uh, just a brief overview. Um, okay, so I suppose, I, I hope that, um, that you agree that um, this prioritization uh, mechanism is uh, an important feature for some important obvious use cases. Um, I hope that um, you're convinced that the, uh, this priority read mechanism uh, is an effective uh, solution. 
Um, and you know, so there's some work done. We know there's a lot more, lot more work to do on this feature, and we're open for uh, collaboration and suggestions. Right. Thanks very much, everyone. All right, all right. This uh, this sounds really useful, and I uh, I'm, I'm so happy to uh, to to have heard about it. Uh, I, I remember when uh, when when you started uh, talking about it. Uh, maybe it was a, a year ago, and I, I, Probably. Wasn't, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I wasn't sure uh, where it was going, but it sounds really useful and effective. So yeah. let's take some questions from the audience. Thank you so much, and I really enjoyed the talk, and especially that the packet loss comparison between 0% packet loss and 30% packet loss. Can we elaborate a little bit more about what is that a zero percent, zero percent of packet loss means in that slide? Is that because the higher priority packet and forget about a lower priority packet? Or I just want to see what that zero percent packet loss means because yeah. that's really awesome. The zero percent packet loss just refers to the iperf, right? The the tenant data will still have twenty eight percent packet drop. Yeah, the background traffic will still have the packet drop, but the high priority control ping traffic simulated with the iperf UDP has zero percent. So that proves that this mechanism of priority reading is really effective. Uh, just a quick thought that you could use our membership library to do a quick classification, because actually this is a very good use case that you can tolerate certain a certain false positive rate, but you want a quick classification that you want to uh, find the high, higher priority flow quickly. Uh, but if you have some false positive rate, that's still fine. So just a quick thought, like you can check it out to see if that works for you. We can discuss that offline. Thanks, we'll definitely, um, we'll definitely think about that. Thanks, just a quick thought. Uh, we have time for more questions, if, if anybody wants to ask any. Uh, let's see. I, I had a question of my own. What was it? Oh, I, I remember now. Uh, so uh, your, your, your algorithm, as, as you presented it, is, is uh, um, uh, go, go through all of the packets in the priority queues and then, uh, and then, then service the lower priority queues. How do you decide, how do you uh, calibrate, uh, for example, the, the budget or the, the number of packets you service from those uh, lower priority queues? Because that, that, that parameter would seem to be uh, fairly critical in, in how things actually perform in practice. Yeah, well, uh, at the moment, as I said, it is super simple at the moment. So as it goes through, the, so the queues aren't ordered in any particular way. It's not like high priority queues have been ordered at the top of the list or anything like that. So just if the queue is marked as being high priority, it completely drains that that queue and, and only then proceeds on with the other ones. Um, I mean, it would definitely be a, an area for more investigation. Um, if you have, you know, um, you know, you could see in a situation where if you had a, a lot of non-priority um, RX queues and one priority, you know, it, it, the system may theoretically fail then at that stage. Okay. You, you know, because uh, you would have, it, it, it's, it's kind of a, I think it's down to the, the number, the ratio basically between available uh, RX descriptors and priority packets is driving it. So if you had, let's say, 64 uh, non priority RX queues and one priority uh, RX queue, then that could skew that, uh, that ratio. But and typically, that, that's that's typically like. only very few of the queues are really highly loaded. It's not that if you even if you have 64 queues, that they are all. Mm. equally highly loaded. But I agree, I mean, we need to do some uh, careful tuning of parameters in this in order to make sure that um, we, we do give sufficient priority for the priority yeah. twos. Yeah, I mean, when we started looking at you, you'd, uh, you could run away with yourself thinking about uh, really sophisticated mechanisms and, you know, these kind of um, fair scheduling algorithms and all this kind of stuff. But 
you know, let's just try the really simple one first. And we have done some experimentation with a number of queues loaded, and we couldn't see any degradation. But we obviously we didn't go to 256 highly loaded queues. Yeah, when I when I first saw uh, saw the beginning of the presentation, I was expecting you were going to go into something like a, a HTB or HFSC or something complicated. And I was actually really pleased to see that you're getting getting good results with something as simple as uh, run the high priority queues first. Yeah. Stay lazy. <laughs> All right, let's thank our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you.